And then some examples of questions the randomization example can help address. So I'll talk about um, one example from uh, one of the MET reports by Tom Kane and Doug Steger and others. And then I'll walk you through an example of a paper that I've just completed um, that uses the randomization sample as well. Just again, it's sort of fixing ideas about ways in which you could, you could use the, the data. And then just a bit of a conversation about how you might analyze the, the randomization sample. And I imagine we've got folks from multiple disciplinary backgrounds. I was trained as an applied economist. I imagine there's other folks in here who weren't, which is probably a good thing um, in some circles. But there's certainly multiple ways and multiple questions um, that the randomization sample can help answer, right? And so that's going to really dictate um, the type of analysis that you're going to do with the data. And then some two, two really important issues related to the randomization sample. So compliance. And compliance is, for those of you who have looked at the user guide, was a real um, issue. And by compliance, we mean how many kids ended up with the teacher, the randomly assigned teacher, right, to whom they were assigned. Um, and then some issues related to generalizability, right? Because again, this is a subsample of a subsample, right? And we'll talk about sort of the importance of being very clear about who is in your analytic sample and what conclusions you can really draw from that sample. And then I'll just sort of open it up to, by the way, not just open it up to it, but throughout if there are questions, please sort of, you know, raise your hand and interrupt me and we'll make it, hey Ben, we'll make this sort of an, iter sort of an iterative back and forth process. Um, but again, any sort of unresolved questions, we can you know, set, si set some time aside at the end to talk about as well. Any questions before we sort of get started? Okay, and so we're not gonna look at any data in the next 45 minutes to an hour, which I guess may be dismaying, dismaying to some, but we, we have, I think, three hours in Beth, right, in the afternoon, and then like two or three hours tomorrow. So by the end of that, hopefully you'll have, you know, a good sense for what this data looks like. But I think it's really important, Beth and I were just talking before we, sta uh, before we started, that we just had the, when we were writing our proposals, and Ben probably the same, we just had Brian Rowan's user guide. So we really had no sense what the data looked like. We had a sense for what Brian and, I forget, White, I forget his, who the, was it Crit? Mark White told us what the data looked like, right? So in this way, I think this gives you a really nice opportunity to get in the data, get a sense for what these variables look like, how you merge data sets, uh, you know, what variables you want to merge these data sets on um, before you really get into any sort of thinking about, okay, what, what are the limits and what are the opportunities that I have with this data? Okay. So, I mean, this is, this is redundant, probably threefold at this point, right? So it's the largest study of classroom teaching ever conducted. Um, Gates generally leads with that, right? Um, it's designed to address a range of questions, right? And so this is, not, this is certainly not reserved for the randomization sample, but the study itself, right? So measurement issues, how reliable and valid are specific measures of teacher effectiveness? Um, you know, do the various measures identify distinctive dimensions of teaching? And if so, what dimensions are identified? I know that Beth has been doing some work looking at, looking at that using the, the observation scores. Um, you know, what measures of effective teaching are empirically related to student learning gains? Again, maybe sort of if your interest rests in sort of linking specific practices in the classroom to things that may be related to um, student performance and stu student outcomes. And then can multiple sources of data on teachers and their teaching be combined to, de de to develop um, fair, valid, and reliable indicators of teacher quality, right? So there are a range of issues from measurement to uh, correlational analyses. And then what's nice about the randomization sample that we'll talk about, it allows for some causal inference with, a get, with, with of course, a series of caveats um, around teacher effectiveness. Okay. So just a bit about some, some study design. Again, this is probably very familiar to everyone in this room at this point. So in the first year of the study in 2009-10, select classes of participating teachers um, were included in the, in the first year of the, sam of the study. And this allowed researchers to construct measures of teaching effectiveness through the observation scores and student surveys, assess the psychometric properties. Am I not speaking loud enough? I'm sorry. Okay. I need to get all the, the depth of my voice. It's very deep. Um, to, ass to assess the psychometric properties of uh, various measures of teaching effectiveness, right? So again, measurement issues related to the various um, uh, 
uh, observation scores and, and, and other measures of teaching performance, and as well as looking at correlations between these measures and student outcomes. Then in the second year, which is the, the year that we're going to focus on in, in the specific subsample of, of the second year, teachers were randomly assigned to classes of students, right? And this design was, or this, this um, year two sample was designed to try to enable causal inference about um, measures of teacher quality and student learning. And again, we'll talk about the limitations given the way that the, the study sort of naturally unfolded um, ex post after the, the randomization. So why would we randomly assign teachers to classes, right? So fundamentally, we want to think about what is the thing we're trying to measure? What's the parameter of interest, right? So what the random ass assignment allows in principle, right, is the ability to say that teacher A was more or less effective, right, in, in creating or rather in producing student outcomes, right? So if a given class of students were to have teacher A rather than teacher B, how much different would student outcomes be at the end of the year, right? So again, we think about randomly assigning a curricular intervention or we randomly assign students to some after school program, right? We want to think about what the counterfactual is and what the random assignment of teachers to classes allows is, again, the counterfactual being what teacher would they have had, right, under some natural uh, sort of teacher-student allocation, right? And so what it does, it's going to eliminate bias from what we know to be true in schools, which is this sort of assortative or non-random matching of students to teachers, right? So for example, if higher performing students were systematically placed in some teachers' classes, right, while lower performing students, rather, were systematically placed in other teachers' classes, measures of teaching effectiveness are going to be subject to um, this sort of sorting bias, right? where, you know, let's imagine that in year one, where there was no randomly as random assignment of teachers to classes, right, higher performing students were grouped in classes, and those groups of classes were systematically placed with, let's say, higher performing teachers, right? And we look at the correlation between an FFT score, right, the Danielson Framework score of teacher performance, and we see that on average, right, higher performing teachers as measured by the FFT generate higher learning gains for um, students, right? And if we were to, uh, if we were to assign a causal uh, interpretation to that, right, we would be very much uh, assigning a causal interpretation to a biased estimate, right? And that estimate is likely upwardly biased, right? Given this positive matching in the year one in this example of teachers to, to classes, right? So again, by, and I think an important thing to remember is that in the randomization sample, students were not randomly assigned to teachers, right? in the sense that individual students weren't, right? So students were grouped in classes together. So you know, we're finding in our work that yes, higher performing kids tend to be grouped in classes with other higher performing kids, right? So we, can, so there's, so we can't say anything about, um, again, the individual student's uh, performance in terms of, um, because again, that, that teacher's not randomly assigned to an individual student. But we're looking at, again, on average, What's the effect of a given teacher when randomly assigned to a class of students, right? So that's an important distinction here. Um, and there are, again, a, a number of logistical reasons why, in this case, different from, like, um, you know, the, the Tennessee small class size project where we couldn't really assign students to teachers. Yeah. Okay, so, the, the, again, so, so we're, you know, in, in a world where teachers are non-randomly sorted to students and vice versa, right? We have a very difficult time sort of disentangling the unique uh, contribution of a teacher to, to a student, right? And that's what this type of randomization process allows for. It allows for us to say that teacher A is more or less effective than teacher B. And I think a critical thing to, to understand, though, is it doesn't allow us to say that um, teachers with higher FFT scores, right, will cause students to have higher performance, right? So there's a, there's a difference between sort of what is a marker of teacher effectiveness, which would be an observation score or a student survey, and teacher quality in and of itself, right? So again, the, the, study, the, the randomization doesn't allow us to say that if we could only move a teacher's FFT score up by half a point on a, what, a one to four scale, they're going to cause, you know, X standard deviation increase in, t in student achievement. Right? So that's a key distinction right, between randomly assigning teacher quality and randomly assigning measures of teacher effectiveness. Right? 
and I'll talk a little bit about that in the context of our work. And um, you know, this is something we've been working through is really making that distinction as well. So it's an important distinction to know up front. Okay. So the random assignment allows for um, a range of questions to be answered about teacher effectiveness and comparisons between these sort of pre-randomization or this, these what we call observational measures of teacher performance and the experimental estimate. So this is to, to your question, right, that, um, you know, again, this comes directly from the work that, that again, Tom Kane and, and others did, which was to say, you know, what's the correlation between, you know, various measures of teacher performance pre-randomization and how well does that predict what we know to be an unbiased estimate of their effectiveness um, in year two. Other questions so far? So this is, again, so, th so thinking about that randomization process to really try to understand how this thing unfolded, which I think is not entirely straightforward, frankly, um, in the user guide, right? So, so in summer 2010, principals created rosters. So these are just classes of students, right? You could just think of like a list. And they've got multiple lists, minimum of two, for every grade subject combination in a school, right? So sixth grade math, right? So you might imagine in school A, You've got, um, you know, three, so we can just do it like this. Can I use this? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like a dry erase. I was about to flip it. Right, so, you know, so in school A, you've got, right, so these are um, sixth grade. Right? And so you've got two rosters, right? And this roster could be like student one through student n sub one, one through n sub two, and one n sub three. So just some number of students in each roster, right? And then you've got teacher, you know, um, just call it school, right? And then you've got teacher A, B, and C. And just you randomly assign teachers to rosters. Right, so that's effectively how they, how they did it, right? And so, right, so these rosters were randomly assigned to teachers within these grade subject combinations. And these grade subject combinations in the randomization data in the user file are alternatively called exchange groups or randomization blocks, right? It's the same thing. The randomization block is going to be the variable that you're going to want to use, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. That's going to be the variable that you're going to want to use to identify that specific block, right? So if we were to just throw a block on this, if we think about like a block randomization design, that's a block, right? And so within the same school, you, might, you will have a second block, right? And that block might be, um, you know, same school, right, seventh grade um, ELA, right? And the same thing, and that would be a second block, right? So the randomization is occurring within these blocks, right? So you can think about this as sort of a, a block randomiz randomization, block randomized design. Okay, so again, so critically important that at least two members of an exchange group had to be teaching at the same school at the time of randomization for teachers to be randomized and included in the randomization sample, right? Which is why the randomization sample, right, is a subsample of a subsample, right? that the randomization sample in year two is a subsample of um, the year two sample, which is a subsample of the year one sample, which is actually right, a non-random sample of the six districts, right? the teachers and students in the six districts. All right. So again, so here, here's exactly what I've just <laughs> described. right? So in year one, we've got the full sample. And so this comes from the user guide from, from Brian Rowan and, and um, White's um, uh, user guide. And I've seen some of these numbers differ, but again, this comes straight from the user guide. Right, so in year one, right, we had about 45, and if someone can explain to me how we have fewer class sections than teachers, that would be great, because I can't figure it out. But again, that, maybe we can get Brian to answer that question. But anyway, so we've got, right, our six districts, about 317 schools, 2,700 teachers, and 4,500 class sections. All right, so from that, you had some group of teachers continue in year two, and then in year two, from these 310 schools, right, and about 2,100 teachers, you were able to construct, right, the randomization sample. So let's talk a little bit about the data, and again, I, I imagine you all have started to look at the data 
um, empirically already and get into the data, but just sort of an overview of what types of records are in the data and then the files themselves, um, which would be a nice thing to have, I think, before you actually start thinking about where do, what do I want to merge and how do I want to create the analytic sample. So the, the data has three sort of broad types of um, information, right? So there's district records, right? So you know, any, for any folks, which I imagine are most, if not all, who've worked with district administrative data, right? You're, you'll have your school teacher and student level data, right? So you'll have demographic characteristics of the, of the students and the teachers, and you'll have student level test scores, right? And so you'll have test scores going back, I think, two or three years before 0910 for those kids that have it. And then you're sort of um, your, your demographic characteristics. And one thing to keep in mind is that for one district, they didn't report free and reduced price lunch status. So you'll see that about a quarter, if not more, of the sample is missing on that, on that variable. All right, so it's something to be aware of. But you've got, so you've got district administrative data, right, which is nice to have in and of itself, right, for those of us who have tried to get district level data. Um, and then you have a bunch of survey data, both for students, teachers, then also some principal survey data, right? So the students, um, so we've got, and Ron will be here when? Tomorrow, Joanna? Yeah. So you've got Ron Ferguson's tripod, so he'll talk you know, much more than I could about the student perception survey, right? Which, was, which I think was given to students in both year one and year two. Um, and teachers were given the teacher working condition survey in year one, and then two different surveys in year two, the, the content knowledge for teaching assessment, and then a MET-generated teacher survey. And then finally, principals in year two were also surveyed about their, about their teachers, right? So some nice survey data on multiple um, units, students, teachers, and from principals. And then for, for those of you who are working with the classroom videos, I don't, but I, I know folks that have, and um, there's quite a, a nice, um, you know, record of, of classroom videos here, and the videos were coded differently depending on the subject, right? So each, each video, um, irrespective of subject, was coded on um, Rob Pianta's class, I'm sorry, Rob Pianta's, sorry, the class, Rob Pianta's Plato, and D Charlotte Danielson's FFT, and then the ELA sessions were coded in addition to the, to the class and the FFT with Plato, by using the Plato instrument, and then um, Heather Hill's MQI for math sections, and then the QST, which I'm not familiar with, um, f on the, the few biology sections that are in the data. So again, just sort of a broad overview of, of the data itself, right? So again, really nice district level, or district administrative data, and then supplemented with survey data, and then I think what's sort of the, one of the main achievements is this, is the, are the videos of the, of the MET data. Any questions on, on the data itself, at least the data that exists in the, in the, in the files? Okay. okay, so what data would you, would you like to know about when you, let's say, want to work with a randomization sample? Right, so the first file that you're going to, well, not the first, but you know, I've broken this up into the class, the student, and the teacher. But the first file that you're going to think about is the class section file. Right, so again, this is the grade subject level file within a school, right? So this file is going to include district, school, teacher, and section IDs. Remember, teachers have, can have multiple sections in principle, right? Um, there's grade subject and year information, right? The randomization block. Now, when we get into the data later this afternoon, we'll find the randomization block variable, and there's actually two. There's the, the one randomization, there, so the, the randomization block one, I think it's called, and then randomization block two. So randomization block one contains 99.8% of the observations, right? And then for those teachers, and there's only very, very few, there was a second randomization block done um, to, to include them in the randomization sample. Frankly, I've only worked with the randomization block one variable, because that covers, you know, once you create your analytic file, that will cover everyone in in your data, at least from my experience. But there, were, but there are two randomization block variables in the data. And then in this section level file, you'll have student aggregate data, right? So basically, student level data aggregated to the section level. Again, the section is just a class, right? A class room. 
and that'll include section level aggregate demographic and achievement variables, right? And then also the section level teacher observation scores on these various, where applicable, right? These various um, observation instruments, all right? You also have teacher value added scores for um, 2008, 9, 9, 10, and 10, 11 school years for math, ELA, and for MET administered exams. So MET administered, I think, two or three, I think it's two um, exams other than the state um, accountability exams, right? To look at, again, you know, to what extent are these measures, are they correlated similarly across different outcomes, right? We know that there's a, a whole literature on, on accountability and how that affects high stakes exams in some ways differently than, than low stakes exams. So Brian Jacob, I guess, who's here, has done a lot, some of that work. And then there's the student perception survey data, which is, again, taking the student level um, responses to the survey and aggregating that up to the, to the section level. Okay. Questions on the, on the section level file. So again, we're thinking about this as, you know, the, the grade by subject group, so the section, then the students within the section, and then the teachers that teach that section. All right, good. So then we, then we think about this, you know, the next file is the student randomization file. And so the student randomization file is going to contain your, your um, unique identifiers. So again, your district, school, teacher, section, and student IDs. Um, your student level demographic and achievement data. Again, this is just the same, these are the same set of variables that have been aggregated at the section level. And now you'll see the individual student survey responses as opposed to the aggregated survey responses at, at the section level. And then key to, you know, again, why you're working with the, random, with the randomization file is who are these randomly assigned teachers? Right, to which sections were these teachers randomly assigned and to which students, right? In the sense that each student will have a randomly assigned teacher, but again, keeping in mind that that teacher was randomly assigned not to the student, but to the class the student was, was assigned to. And again, non-randomly assigned to. So, and I just, um, Joanna, they'll have these slides, right? Okay, so, you know, so when you get into this file, you'll go and you'll see this teacher ICPSR ID rand assign, and this is the, the ICPSR ID for the teacher to which the student was randomly assigned, right? So you observe, again, the teacher that was randomly assigned to a particular section, right? And then you've got two actual IDs, right? So you've got, we'll start with the one under here, the actual October. So that's the teacher to whom the student actually had a grade subject class with, right, as of October, right? which may be, and in many cases is, different from the random assignment variable, right? And we'll talk about compliance issues. Um, and then you also observe, right, the actual teacher, again, by grade, subject, within school, right, who the teacher had come May of that school year, right? So you might be, there's some really interesting things I think you could do with this. You know, we're starting to look at, or we're looking at now, sort of, the nature of the sorting process ex post, right? So ex, so after randomization, but I don't know anyone that started to really look at, well, what about intra, intra year sorting, right? So this at least allows for, I mean, there's two time points, but it at least allows for, you know, to look and see whether, you know, some kids, you know, whether kids stayed with the randomly assigned teacher and then did they ultimately end up with a different teacher? Again, you don't know if that happened in, you know, November or April, but you at least know that it, it happened, right? So there's some interesting, again, within year variation that may exist um, to answer some, I think, interesting questions about, again, within year student sorting, yeah. And then the teacher file. So again, this is the, identifies each teacher in the data. So here we've got school, district school and teacher IDs, right? And again, it'll tell you which grade, subject, and year the teacher um, was assigned to. And then you're gonna use this teacher file and bring in the, you know, the teacher characteristics, right, and merge that into um, the section file, right, because again, the section file is going to uniquely identify the teacher in that section, and this provides those background characteristics for that particular teacher. 
So again, this, this file will also have the randomization block and, an alt, and, and a variable which indicates whether that teacher was in the randomization sample to begin with. Right? So if you want to work with the randomization sample, one of the things you certainly would want to do is um, you know, sort on presence in the randomization sample. Right? If the teacher's not in the randomization sample, get rid of them. Right? And that, so the idea here is to start to, you know, you have to be very deliberate about thinking about what's the analytic sample that you want to construct given these different, um, you know, given how the randomization sample was constructed. So the teacher needs to be present in the randomization sample. And in some cases, maybe you'll find a teacher in the randomization sample that got a zero on the randomization sample indicator. Right? So again, there's going to be some issues like that. So you're going to want to make sure that everyone that's retained in your sample should be there. Right? You'll have, as I said, the teacher demographics and background characteristics. So I think there's race, gender, experience in the district, um, master's degree and above. I think that's it, Beth, right? Yeah. You have teacher survey responses, right? So again, each teacher's individual responses to the year one and year two surveys. And then also principal responses on those particular teachers, which I think is an underused. I know Doug actually mentioned this in our webinar, but an underused area is the, um, are the principal survey responses. Okay. So again, this is all sort of background about what exists, right? Questions at this point? All right, so well, what do we, so why do we care? So what can this sample actually help us address, right? So I'm gonna use, I'll, I'll talk in depth about one example, but there's, Two examples that I think, I don't know of any others yet that have been published, but that, that have used the randomization sample. So certainly Tom Kane and Doug McCaffrey and um, Trey Miller and Doug Stager's paper, which is, um, if you haven't read it, before you do anything with the randomization sample, that's, that's a must read. That's a, that's, a, um, that's, a, that's a best seller, right? So be sure you're very familiar with, with what they've done and how they've done it because it gives a lot of insight into um, how you can use and what you can learn from the randomization sample, right? And so what they did in this paper was ask first, did measures of teaching successfully identify sets of teachers who produced higher student achievement gains on average, right? And they measured student, rather they measured effective teaching using a composite of multiple, of multiple um, teacher performance measures. They use the observation scores from classroom observations, student surveys, as well as value-added measures. The answer here is yes when you use a composite measure. Right? We'll talk about the answer being no when you use one measure. But, and then next, and then we talked a little bit about this before, did the magnitude of the differences correspond with what we would have predicted based on their pre-randomization effectiveness? Right? So using their 0910 scores, to what extent are, were they able to say, um, those were predictive of what we would expect in a world where there is, this not, there is no non-random sorting of teachers to classes um, to identify effective teaching. So again, this is critical to read. Um, it actually came out, I think, five months after we submitted our proposal, but would have been nice to actually have seen before. Um, so Rachel Garrett, who also who's my co-author the, the, on the, um, the project that's funded by the the Early Career Award, um, we looked at whether, again, we can identify teaching effectiveness using just Danielson's classroom observation instrument. Under the, sort of motivating this work by the fact that most um, observations uh, instruments being implemented at the state and district levels are either the FFT itself or some variant of the FFT, right? Um, and so I'll just, and this is not to humor myself, but at least, but really just to provide an example of how you can actually, what can be answered with the randomization sample. I'll walk a little bit through what we did with the paper. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the, the two key issues, or three key issues, right? Analyzing the data, which, um, Kristen, Kirsten, yeah. that was her, your question about analysis. And then we'll talk about the compliance issues, which I think the lady in the back asked. <laughs> and um, generalizability. Okay, so, so again, so what data did we use? Again, so drawing from the analytic file, from the, sorry, from the data files that we just talked about. 
So we looked at the observation scores from the FFT. We used section, teacher, and student level demographics, right? And then student level test score. So again, thinking about these multiple data files, and we had to be very um, careful about merging across them, right? Because again, there's there, you know, these three or four, depending on how many files you're working with, these multiple data files and the merge can be a little tricky and you want to be very careful about, again, are you merging on students, are you merging on teachers, are you merging on sections? Um, so you want to be very careful about how you create the analytic file. So we're going to leverage the randomization of teachers to students, or teachers to classes, right? And we'll use IV techniques to address in the potential, but the real non-random sorting of um, students to teachers post-randomization. All right, so we did a couple things. We did some measurement stuff. So we came up with um, a measure of teacher practice. So we used, a, for those of you familiar, just a principal components analysis just to come up with um, a measure of um, teaching performance, right, relying on the sort of the unique variation of the observation protocol. So we came up with one, um, one component that underlies these multiple dimensions of the FFT. So we just use that one measure of teaching pr uh, practice. But we also had to account for, so in addition to measuring teacher performance, right, we also had to account for non-compliance. So there's, there was extensive, and we'll talk in more detail in a few minutes, uh, non-compliance. So there were many students that didn't comply with their initial random assignment to, to the teachers, right, by section, right? And we know if the student non-compliance is non-random, right? So if students are systematically being moved or initiating a move away from their randomly assigned teacher, right, teacher effectiveness and all the things about a teacher, right, that we call teacher quality or teacher performance or teacher effectiveness is no longer orthogonal, right, no longer uncorrelated with student background characteristics, right? That's the whole idea of the randomization, right? Is that we want to break the link, the student-teacher non-random link that we know happens in classes, right, all the time. And so we have this IV strategy where we basically just use the randomly assigned teacher's prior year measure of instructional practice, which we created this way, and we instrument for the observed instructional practice of a student's actual teacher. So the idea being that, um, you know, we observe, we've got some measure of a teacher's performance in year two, right, that we want to say identifies student achievement. In the sense that we want to use this thing and see if teachers with higher levels of this teacher performance generate on average higher levels of student performance. Again, that's distinctly different than saying teachers with higher FFT scores cause higher student performance, right? Or the, it's the FFT that causes it. And so what we use is we use, we say that teachers measure of teacher practice before the randomization, right, should be correlated with their measure of teacher practice if we think that there's some underlying latent ability performance measure of a teacher, but should not be correlated with the student's outcome in the second year. So that's what we do, um, although you know, some of the reviewers from EPA weren't so convinced, but I appreciate the, the sentiment nonetheless. Um, so again, so, so that's what we did, and what we ultimately found was that, yes, in year two, when we, you look at the correlation between a teacher's observational scores and student achievement, they're highly correlated. When you use the IV strategy, we're unable to, identi to causally identify effective teachers. But there are reasons for that, right? There's a ton of noncompliance, right? And we also found that, in fact, I'm happy to send you the paper, that this thing is weakly correlated with this thing, meaning that how teachers are being scored on the FFT in the prior year is weakly correlated. It's significantly correlated, but not strongly correlated with this. And for any of, any of us who have been, and I taught fifth grade, but any of us who have been in classes, we know that the, the mix of students that we get in a given year, right, influences in some ways how we teach, right? It doesn't make us more better or worse teachers, but it may also influence how we're observed or how we're scored on our observations, right? And so we see that, you know, so the things that we saw, frankly, we were very disappointed that we couldn't causally identify them, but when we thought a little bit more deeply about it, we realized that, you know, in fact, 
what we're finding is that instruction is very context specific and driven by the sort of idiosyncratic mix of students, right? And you know, this the non-compliance was a huge problem, which is what we're working on now. So anyway, that's so that is just by means of giving an example of what you could actually do with um, with the data. Section level, yeah. Okay, and so here we use the randomization block fixed effects, right? Because that, so you think about, again, what's the, what's the level of randomization? So again, if you were gonna look at, you know, if you were to randomly assign schools to some treatment condition, right? You're gonna, within a block of, let's say, some neighborhood, you've got 10 schools and you randomly assign them and you've got another block, right? You're not gonna, you're gonna wanna have that randomization block fixed effect because that's going to control for right, the fact that the unit of randomization was at that level. Now, if you want to look at how certain blocks may differ on the outcome of you know, what the variance both within and across blocks are, then that's fundamentally a sort of random effects approach, which we can talk about also. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the analysis. So again, it's going to depend on the question of interest. Right, so in Tom Kane and, and, and Dan's and Doug Stager's paper, right, and in, in our paper, we just ha we employ OLS regression and IV techniques, right? But certainly the randomization sample is going to allow for comparisons across students within the same school grade and subject, but also, right, across these things. So, like we were just mentioning, a fixed effect approach. So again, fixing the all unobserved things about the randomization block, just putting in a dummy variable for randomization block is going to allow you to account for all things that are unobserved about that level of randomization so that all comparisons are going to be made within, um, across units within the, the randomization block, right? So across classes, right, within that randomization block, yeah? So a random effects or, or hierarchical approach, right, might allow for, and there are others who are probably, you know, again, know this better than I, right, allow for examination of the extent of the variability across as well as within these randomization blocks, right? So if you want to see what factors at the block level, for example, may influence differences in student outcomes, right, and attribute the variance or decompose the variance to different, to, to section level, to block level, right, you can do that in, in this approach as well. So there's, so to answer your question again, you know, there's multiple ways to analytically deal with the, ra or use the randomization blocks, but again, it's gonna depend on the thing that you're interested in, in answering. If you're interested in answering about, uh, questions about teacher effectiveness, right, you're gonna use, you, you wanna fix everything because you wanna use the randomization in and of itself. If you wanna look and see how, again, um, what may be one thing. So maybe within a school, for example, you've got multiple randomization blocks across grade and subject, and maybe there are differences that you want to model um, at the grade subject level that you, um, you could use the randomization blocks for, right? So there, again, the, I have to think a little bit more about that, but there, there are certainly ways to do that. Or there are questions that could be answered, rather, um, using that approach. But again, you, it also depends on your orientation, right? This is fundamentally about causal inference, this is, very, this is very much descriptive, right? Okay. So again, we can, we can save, we can have more conversation about this later after the, after the presentation or you know, over the next day or so as you're working with the data. Okay. So as we've talked a lot about already, there was quite a bit of noncompliance, right? And this noncompliance is gonna vary at the school level as well as at the district level. Right? So what does it mean to, to be a non-complier? It simply means that you don't end up in the class with the teacher that was randomly assigned to you. And by to you, I mean to the class in which you were assigned, right? There were also situations where teachers were not with the assigned classrooms. So, what, so I've got a second paper now that what we're finding is that, in fact, you've got whole groups of kids randomly assigned to teacher A that end up together with teacher B. And you say, how does that even happen? Well, it happens because, and we'll talk, uh, it happens basically because schools did not comply with the randomization process, right? So schools, principals, were sending out teacher assignments, 
before they received the randomly assigned teachers back from the MET researchers, right? So what we observe, of course, is entire groups of kids ending up with a totally different teacher other than the randomly assigned teacher. What we also find, which is most interesting, is that you've got classes where you've got some kids comply and some kids don't. Some kids stay with the randomly assigned teacher and some kids leave. And that's where the interesting, a lot of the interesting action is in terms of thinking about sort of non-random sorting of kids to, to, to classes. So that's what we're working on now, actually. But, so there were many logistical problems. So this is just a picture of you know, what, the, what the extent of the non-compliance looked like. And this is, um, again, this is from White and Rowan's user guide. And these are for grades four through eight. And we've stack, they stack the math and ELA samples. So this is all kids in grades four through eight, right? And so you can see that in Dallas, 65% of the kids ended up with the teacher to whom they were assigned, right? Or to whom was, to, who was assigned to them. 2% ended up with a different teacher in that randomization block. A quarter of the kids stay in the school but end up with some other teacher that either is or is not in the data. And the teacher will only be in the data if they're in the year two sample, right? Keeping in mind that the randomization sample is a subsample of that year two sample. And then you've got a 1% that end up somewhere else and 5% that just disappear, right? It's unclear. I mean, I guess they know that these kids are in other districts and they just don't know where these kids ended up, private schools or another state, who knows, right? But you can see the variability just across districts, right? 65% of the kids comply with a randomly assigned teacher in Dallas, less than a third in Memphis, right? And there's also variability in the share that end up with a different, that actually remain in that randomization block, and then that stay in the school, right? There's really, and there's actually quite a bit of action here in terms of the missing ones. So these are things to think about when we're thinking about, again, we'll talk about generalizability in a second. So again, I'll, you know, th there was quite a bit of noncompliance, and it was due, due to a number of, of things, right? So again, just to summarize how these, these things were constructed. Right, so these class groups, so again, these, these rosters, some of which were filled with students before the randomization, others weren't, right? And again, the idea being that if I'm a, in, in, in most cases, if I'm a principal and I construct rosters of kids, right? I mean, anecdotally, I taught fifth grade in New York. There was 501 through 505. I taught 505, guess what? 505 had kids, 35 kids, on average repeated fifth grade twice. 501 were all 10-year-olds in the fifth grade who had never repeated. Right, so it's no mystery what's going on. So the principal's faced with that same situation, the random assignment prevents them, right, from non-randomly putting their best friend's son in that class and the first year kid who doesn't know what's going on in this class, right? So. But again, they've, they've got these rosters, right? And the kids were non-randomly assigned to the rosters, right, in the summer of 2010, right? But they, the, the principals didn't know, right, which students or which teachers ultimately were gonna show up, at, going to show up in the fall. And given the six districts that, that the, the study took place in, right, these, these large urban districts, there's a lot of mobility, right? There's a lot of mobility so there's also, right, so there's a lot of uncertainty about who it actually ended up. But basically what they did was say, here, you know, they gave these rosters over in the summer of 2010 to the MET researchers, and they did the randomization, right? So, so following random assignments, so after the MET researchers randomly assigned teachers to classes, some students transferred to other schools, as we saw in the previous table, or to other teachers' classes in the same school, right? So there was this mobility, this both out of school and within school mobility. Some teachers left teaching or taught different course sections or grades than had actually been planned under the randomization, right? So we may observe some teachers that were um, in the randomization sample but ultimately didn't have any kids in their class. Those may have been teachers that were originally assigned to one of these classes but ultimately who didn't end up teaching that grade or subject. And all of this is going to lead to noncompliance, right? And then as I mentioned, in some cases, and frankly in many cases, schools just didn't implement the randomization. They, and I've talked to Doug about this, they just basically, 
sent out as they would under natural circumstances teacher assignments to the kids or to the families, right? And didn't wait for the MET researchers to provide the randomized uh, teachers. So in terms of sort of thinking about modeling um, or, or, or dealing with the, the non-compliance when you're modeling um, various things, right? So in the, in the work that I was just talking about that, that Kane et al. and that I had done, um, you know, you can model what's called the intent to treat estimate, right? Which is just, again, what's the effect of being assigned um, teacher A instead of teacher B or teacher C instead of teacher B, right? Without addressing the non-compliance, right? Is anybody familiar, familiar with the walled estimate, walled estimator? Okay, that's all it is, right? So, you know, if you just, if you just regress the randomly assigned teachers, so this is randomly assigned teachers' um, effectiveness on the outcomes, that's going to produce, right, the intent to treat estimate, right? And, right, that's just going to be, what's that, the covariance of T2 randomized Y, right? And so that's going to understate the fact that we know, so the walled estimate is just, um, you know, this thing, the ITT, scaled up, right, by how many kids actually comply, right? So when we adjust for the, the non-compliance, right, you can think about that thing, the walled estimate is just a treatment on the treated, right, or a local average treatment effect, that's going to be bigger than the intent to treat effect, right? So again, so non-compliance is going to have a direct effect on um, the magnitude of your estimate as well as, right, importantly, the interpretation of your estimate, right? Because the estimate is going to be for, the, for those kids who complied, right? It's going to be for those kids who complied, right? It's like you think about any sort of IV, right, and it's going to induce movement and you're thinking about who is it going to induce movement for, and that's going to be the, the group of kids or group of units for which that local average treatment effect is, is relevant. Okay. And just a couple words on generalizability, because again, we want to think about what we can actually say about who, whom. Whom can we actually say anything about, right? So keeping in mind that the randomization is within a school, right? So it's not going to allow for any um, tests of sort of between teacher, rather tests of um, between school comparisons of teacher effectiveness, right? If you're in this sort of fixed effect world, right? When we're using teacher effectiveness in a causal way, right? And causal, I mean, again, the causal effect of a teacher on student outcomes, right? So again, you can do between school comparisons, but not of teacher effectiveness, right? Given the, the way in which the randomization was, was designed. Right, this, the distribution of teacher value added among those that were participating, those teachers that participated actually did look similar in the full sample to other teachers in the district. So in some cases, you may be able to general again with the, with this caveat and empirically trying to look at what those those differences are. There may be some ability to generalize to teachers in that same district, but keeping in mind that special ed students and ELL students were underrepresented in the in the randomization sample for obvious reasons. Right they needed certain teachers with certain qualifications to actually um, be their teachers, right? So what we see in the, in the data is somewhat higher baseline test scores in the full district sample, right? So I think the mean is something like in the area of like 0.05 to 0.1 on math and ELA, which is again from a, from a district mean of zero, right? Because all of these test scores are standardized at the district, at the district level. Well, grade, grade by, right, at the grade level, but within, within district. Grade subject within district. And I think it's also really important to keep in mind that any, general, any sort of conclusions you make are really generalizable to those sample of students and teachers in the analytic sample. So as I started out with, right, the full MET sample included a non-random subset of all teachers and students within each of the six participating districts. Right, so again, you're already starting with a non-random sample of that school district. The year two six randomization sample was a subset of that full MET sample, right? So I think it's really important to be careful about the populations of students and teachers about whom you, conclusions um, can be drawn, right? So I think you know everybody sort of throws away table one 
depending on what paper you're, what type of paper you're writing. Papers, I generally write table one is this, who's in my, who's in my data, right? But table one is really important in this setting, right? Because it says, look, I'm making these, I'm doing this, I'm analyzing this question, I've got these results, and it's relevant for these groups of students and teachers, right? Which is a very different thing than if you were working with, you know, New York City data, and you've got student level data from New York City, you know, to the extent that, that your, your sample is representative of students in New York City, then you could say something about students in New York City. But you can't say that here, right? At least using the randomization sample, because it is, again, a non-random sample, right, of a sample of, of, of the district. So I'm going to stop there.